Welcome to SciTech Culture with Steve Kern and Ben Warner, where we examine science, technology, and culture in the 21st century. Visit our website at SciTechCulture.com. Hello and welcome to SciTech Culture. My name is Ben Warner and I'm joined once again by my good friend and colleague Steve Kern. How are we today, Steve? Welcome to 2020. Um, it's uh, the start of a new year and uh, we've got a couple of good topics to talk about, so it'd be good uh, to kick this off. I was going to say we've got a couple of very 2020 topics, I think, yeah. uh, you know, uncharted territory. Now, just want to preface by sa- this by saying that I was perfectly happy to just talk about um, food's future. That was what we, what we will eventually get to, but um, we unfortunately... We um, have to start off with um, the season four um, opening episode of uh, the Trump presidency um, because uh, he just doesn't disappoint, does he? Um, like uh, we had the ultimate cliffhanger at the end of season three last year with his impeachment yeah. and literally within the first few days of the of 2020, we're already talking about him, um, you know, getting into war with with Iran, um, yeah. targeting the Soleimani guy and or whether he was targeted or whatever. The, the amazing thing is, is that um, in from what I understand, um, like when they were presenting the, you know, the the options to him, um, the killing of this guy was like considered the most extreme option, at least that's what was described. And then that was meant to be there um, to sort of highlight that the other options were better. Mm-hmm. Um, and as just about everyone said in the aftermath of it, including a lot of very witty comedians, you never give Trump the most extreme option because you know that's the one he's going to take um, and that seems to be the, the one he's taken and uh, it's just, I mean, I'm sitting here sort of half smirking and laughing. It's not funny because, you know, no, they, they came pretty close to some situation. and what I find actually even more astounding is that um, Iran responded with the traditional like it's almost like they didn't know what to do because they weren't expecting it, and they went with the proportional response, hoping there wouldn't be further retaliation. Because the eye for the eye. Yeah, because I mean, it can't be an accident that their um, retaliation, the attack that they did, didn't kill any Americans. That can't be an accident either. Yeah, look, I, you know, I think you've hit the nail on the head. There's almost a satirical element. To be away from the the very the big seriousness of it, and look, I I don't think that you know there's there's much more we can add to that. But on the on the more satirical side, whatever you think ethically of of the actions, Trump has shown again that he's just capable of breaking deadlocks, breaking rules, and progressing situations. And and really, the the outcome where he threatened. There was a retaliation and then he's done the usual Trump thing, which is, a, well, okay, let's leave it at that mm. and move on. Uh, well, that's a whole new way of, of world, world politics and world conflict and maybe it's a better way than just letting the pressure build through uh, the appeasement that we've seen in the past, but only history will be able to tell in another another 10 years hopefully we'll still be here to uh to make a verdict there seemed to be a part of this that um almost seemed like that everyone else is afraid of what trump is doing um and they're, they're like any response that they have they can't do the traditional response with a typical u.s president because they know how a typical u.s president would respond but like you said um you know breaking through the deadlock seems to be coming I don't know whether, how intentional that is on his part, of course, but um, it seems like um, he's such a loose cannon in that respect that they really don't know how he would respond. Well, that- it's interesting. I think you hit the nail on the head with people are afraid of him and I think, you know, people on Trump's side are afraid of him, his opponents are afraid of him, everyone who doesn't think exactly like him that tend to have a bit of fear. And the reason for that is that, it's hardwired into our human systems Mm. that when we can't predict a situation or what someone's actions might be, it triggers a fear response in us. Mm. And uh, I think that's really uh, the key to Trump's power is that he manages to make people uncertain uh, through his unpredictability and that, that tends to make allow him to win and um, it's probably worked in business and it's now working in politics and I guess it's now working working in uh, sort of, you know, policy circles almost. It's yeah. quite, quite unprecedented. 
Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, obviously it was a, uh, an effective distraction from his current domestic woes um, as well. I don't know if he really would have put it on the, uh, as something deliberate, of course, but, um, you know, uh, we're only talking about him potentially going to the impeachment trial in the Senate as early as next week, if possible. Allegedly, we're, we've seen previous presidents under impeachment uh, allegedly do the same thing. What was that movie called? Uh, Wag the Dog? I mean, Wag the Dog, which was <laughs> even before that, but yeah. um, referring to Clinton and uh, the Balkans yeah. uh, while he was being impeached. So <laughs> is it is it something out of a standard playbook but with a bit of a Trump flair or is it just that the fact that the world's gone crazy? Yeah, maybe a little bit of both, potentially. <laughs> um, all right, well, uh, we'll move on from that. We're going to keep checking in with Trump this year because um, obviously it's going to be a massive story all the way up until uh, November when uh, the election finally gets here. And uh, I, I predict a very unpredictable um, ride in that regard. Well, Facebook, just on that, Facebook has come out and said that they're not going to ban political advertising. <laughs> <laughs> That's a just for me. That's just a can of worms for them. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully, they uh, get called to account at some point. Um, um, they will, but after the election, that's yeah. always the problem. Yeah, that's right. All right, so let's get on to our actual topic before Trump disrupted us. Of course, um, <laughs> the um, uh, I was reading a story on the ABC about it. This um, uh, Israeli food um, industry um, looking at um, some technological solutions in terms of experimenting with. Uh, insects and computer design sweeteners in terms of you know what do we, how do we sort of manufacture food in the future i found it a quite a fascinating article before we get into that though um obviously it's about um how we're going to feed people um going into the next few decades you know world population projected potentially up to 10 billion mm. by the middle of the century that's a lot of mouths to feed um i wanted to start though with uh, something we were uh, doing offline which was um i um i, I went and uh, tried that um hungry jacks uh, rebel whopper <laughs> did a bit of a an experiment with the team you know so i've got a sample size of three that were in that day that we we chopped it up and uh, we all um had a bit of a bite to see you, cho uh, you chopped it up you didn't even have a whole one each oh uh, it was all, it was all very scientific i tell you um so anyway the um i think the consensus was that um if uh, some if you were just handed one uh and you did and you were just told it's a whopper you probably would think it's a whopper um, Certainly, if, if you were drunk, you wouldn't think any different. That's right. If you were to eat a, whop, a real whopper with the rebel whopper side by side, you could probably tell the difference. But like you said, it's not it's not as if it was any healthier for you because uh, we you know had a look at the breakdown, the nutrition breakdown, <laughs> and it wasn't that great. But it was an interesting sort of experiment, actually, in the sense that it it, it could it wasn't. A, maybe they could have done better because maybe they should have made it um, more palatable to eat so that you would prefer it over the standard mm -hmm. Whopper and then that would potentially lead people to start eating that instead of the actual Whopper. But um, it is an, a, an interesting um, experiment that they conducted because, um, you know, I'd be perfectly happy to eat one, eat a meal, uh, eat one of those if I, go to, if I ever go to Hungry Jack's again in the near future or anything like that. It wouldn't, like, annoy me to eat one of those as opposed to some of their... Uh, you know, vegetarian options that they've had in the past. That's right. But I, I think uh, the interesting thing is both our teams independently tested and came up with the same conclusion. And, and mm. while there's no problem with eating a Rebel Whopper, uh, it kind of maybe because the standards of the Whopper, you know, yep. perhaps have, have fallen in recent years, it doesn't make you want a Whopper anymore, Rebel or otherwise. Mm. And I think that's, that's the missed opportunity, as you're saying, if they – they found some way just to make it a little bit better. But, I mean, there's still room for improvement. They've got time to um, to improve it if they think uh, there's, uh, I don't know, some uh, some dough in it for them maybe. Not bread so dough, they, of course. That's <laughs> right. Well, they, they could add some of the products you're about to talk about. Exactly, exactly. Um, the... Uh, Oh, and of course, we're not, um, you know, sponsoring Hungry Jacks or anything like that in this particular mm -hmm. thing. But um, it's worth pointing out that I think it was, a, it was an interesting experiment that they're uh, conducting there as well. Um, I mean, just, uh, you know, they've just in this first paragraph here, it's like, uh, in the future, you may find yourself eating eggs made of plants, fruit, fly, larvae, energy bars, or your favorite soft drink sweetened with a computer design, zero kilojoule, sugar-free 
protein. Um, all very interesting stuff. I think the thing that really um, caught my eye was that um, Mediterranean fruit fly larvae that they were talking about that yeah. they can that they could use a hundred percent of the the material, so there's no wastage uh, at all. But they do manage to get they extract an oil. Sorry, they. Um, they, yeah. they extract fat out of it and an, and an oil that they can sell to cosmetic companies and then the remaining powder is 70% protein and 12% minerals. Um, like So the fact that there's so much whole protein in there is very useful um, and uh, leads to a lot of opportunities in terms of what they could potentially create out of it. Um, and uh, I, I don't know why they can't just uh, get cracking on this stuff uh, quicker really. I mean, I don't know. Mm. I mean, maybe this is an example, but um, I'm sure there's um, lots of other ways that um, potentially solve the same issue. There are lots of problems with this. Mm. So okay, I'll let you. I'll let you take over then. <laughs> I actually know a lot about this. So, firstly, I'm 100 percent on board with this, and it's fantastic. Uh, and in fact, that whole article was a great article. But there's a whole lot of things that they're not saying. In that okay. article. So, so there's no waste, sure, but uh, I mean. You have to think about the volumes that you require, mm. and if you think of the size of a fruit fly larva, which is just a couple of mil, yeah, think how many of those you'd need personally for a meal, right? And the size, right? Mm -hmm. So just think of the size. So if you just thought, say, uh, for for a day's worth of of fruit fly larvae as food, you needed the size of a house brick, mm. all right? Have a look outside and look at a house which has probably got about 10,000 bricks in it or something like that, that's 10,000 people for a day. And if you had to produce that every day, suddenly you need very, very large plants to achieve the scale. So these are still the issues that burn. This is why we, we need large areas open to crops. So don't get me wrong, these are all great techniques and great opportunities. Mm. The idea of, uh, you know, uh, growing insects and grinding them up and putting them into flowers and fortifying foods is probably the way it has to go simply because of the volumes that are, that are required. So this is why, even though it's such a great idea, it's got this hurdle at the moment mm. of how they get to the scale to really make it economic. Mm. And the, the other side is they already have done all the research, it's very hard to convince someone to eat a meal of 100% fruit fly larva. Well, un un unless you, you tell them it's something else, of course. Um, Which you're not allowed to. <laughs> well, I don't know. What's the rebel waffle? Well, if, made well if, they, if they break it down and turn it into something else, you know, who, who knows? Rebel but, waffles? <laughs> exactly. But just on that, in terms of the scale, isn't that barring some, you know, whiz bang? spectacular breakthrough um, that can solve that problem isn't that just inherent um, because it's even like with just production now you need a lot of material to make the material yeah. because you're transferring it from one form into another so you can't just magically um, create it out of thin air kind of thing um, it, it's got to come right. from somewhere so so you're spot on. So if you think about it, uh, to get those lava or to get the lava going, they'll need some sort of substrate. It could, it might be as simple as sugared water. Mm. You still need sugar, you still need water, you still need to get it there. And then, you know, like you, you have to have that food for them to grow. Now, it might be all right to, uh, you know, I don't know, make a 1,000 meals a day for people that way. Mm. But how do you make 100,000? Yeah. meals a day how do you make a million meals a day you know and these these are the issues so they're, they're scale issues and they are right across every industry now when it comes to these sorts of uh, technologies i guess then the uh, the comparison would be um I, okay you need um, a lot of larvae but what about um the meat industry needing a lot of cows right now and the effect that that's having on the environment and that we don't exactly. think about it's the same well i mean which one is that does it become a question of which one is worse um to um to manage or what could be potentially worse well it's Exactly, but the the problems is, uh, associated with scaling up production of your insect or larvae or uh, recombinant uh, yeasts producing um, mm. uh, factors 
is is purely that um, it's it's just how do you get to that size? You know, it's it's a lot of vats. You know, you look at the wine industry; they have a lot of tanks. You know, the yeah. really big winemakers, um, and yet if you were to do that and you were harvesting a product like uh, some sort of factor or protein expressed by yeast or whether it was fruit fly, fly larva, you've still got all the processing that comes after and you've got to maintain that constantly. So, I, I mean, I'm all for these new technologies. I think there's no question mm. if you move to an alternative protein that's the same cost as meat, that ethically there's no argument for eating meat anymore mm. that I can see. Um, you know, they won't stop people eating meat, but, you know. It might just become more, more expensive an option as like we've sort of mentioned in the past potentially. Yeah. Well, it would. If, if you can bring down these products to the same cost as meat, um, then it would put pressure on the meat industry. Then you would have less cattle and then you would have less people eating meat. But they still probably have another decade to go. Mm. I really wonder... Um, I guess your Impossible Foods and your Rebel Whoppers, they're made from plant material so they have enough stock and you can just put it into a standard processing yeah. uh, plant to create your meats or relatively normal meat processing uh, kind of plant to extrude it and, and get get your packaging. You can't do that with larvae. So these haven't been developed yet. Hopefully over the next 10 years they will and this will revolutionise the way we eat. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, what about the idea then, uh, if we're trying to wrap it up, the idea that um, perhaps it's more about a combination of factors that are going to get there. So if they start to introduce this a little bit and then maybe they come up with something else and then something else and then maybe it's just a combination of things that um, can maybe assist with the scale and maybe um, uh, that, uh, what was it, that uh, uh, thing you mentioned offline the other week about, you know, it'd be good if you could only eat once a week um, and that yeah, would yeah, and, and, well, and, and, and that'd satisfy your uh, nutritional requirements. <laughs> I think look, I think there's there's... Uh, probably about three three things, and, and the Israeli sort of food tech industry is amazing. Mm. Like they've really embraced it. Uh, in that article, it also talks about um, uh, computer design sweeteners. Well, I mean that that's not a new technique. They've been using it in pharmaceutical mm. industry to design new drugs, and now they're just applying it to sweeteners and and to get special specialist products for food. Yeah, but their knowledge and what they will do will will in time revolutionise the industry and I think there are three three areas here. One is space food, which will see us eat less in space and get better nutrition through fortification of foodstuffs. And I think what you might see is that uh, your Rebel Whopper, unfortunately, the patty isn't really that good for you, no. not to mention the rest of the stuff on the plate. Maybe the tomato and lettuce and onions okay, but <laughs> I'm not sure about anything else. Um but if you could fortify that or get more flavour using these techniques or using these insect-based additives, then uh, why not? And mm. then, as you said before, that's probably the best way for um, these foods to develop. Yeah, absolutely. And for people to access them at a reasonable price with a good nutritional profile. Absolutely. A good place to finish up. We'll um, uh, wrap it up uh, there. It's a good start to 2020, Steve. Um, I'm hoping uh, this... Uh, I don't know, maybe we'll get some uh, new types of uh, tech and science topics developing, uh, hopefully. We seem to be, you know, we're almost, um, you know, nine, ten years after we started this podcast and things have changed uh, dramatically over the last uh, while, so it'll be good to see if uh, we can see more uh, more and interesting stuff that maybe we might have been talking about as predictions in the past. Absolutely. I don't think, you know, we would have predicted a lot of these things. I mean, who, who really would have thought even three years ago, probably a bit like prior to the iPad, but uh, we'd have iPads and uh, artificial uh, protein-based meats. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so don't forget to check out our website, SciTechCulture.com. You can get all of our links and content there, our RSS feeds, YouTube Vimeo feeds. You can subscribe to all those. And we've got all our blogs, etc. cetera. And uh, we greatly appreciate your visit to the website. All right, so that's it for this episode. We'll catch you next time.